Normally when I do have a talk like this, one of the fun things for me is not being prepared for it. I just enjoy showing up and speaking about whatever I happen to feel like speaking about at the time and just makes it a lot more fun. In this particular case, it was listed in the uh, program that I'm going to be speaking about the Rat Pack. And that's as good a place as any to get started. And let me just do a little bit of talking about not only the Rat Pack, but the entertainment here in Las Vegas during those years. As many of you are aware, there was a lot of mob presence and ownership at all of the different hotels here and all of the other avenues that would bring money in. One of them was the entertainment industry. One of the Chicago Outfits point man here in Las Vegas went under the name of Joe Batters. Excuse me, I'm very sorry, I'm, I'm gonna give you a better story. A guy named Johnny Roselli. Johnny Roselli was appointed by his boss, who at the time was Momo Giancana, to come to Las Vegas and watch out for Chicago's interest, the outfit's interest in the city. Any of you who were at the wonderful banquet that we have were fortunate enough, along with myself, to listen to Burton Cohen speak. Burton Cohen, of course, is still involved in the gaming industry, and there's many things that he cannot say, but I can up here because there's nothing that I'm going to say that's, that's not correct. Burton was the president of the Desert Inn in its last years. The Desert Inn used to have some wonderful, wonderful guests who lived there permanently. Among those guests, when Marshall Chefana was here in town, he was the number one hit man in Las Vegas, early 50s, and then again in the very early 60s. He lived at the Desert Inn. Also, Johnny Roselli lived at the Desert Inn, and Johnny Roselli had a business that he operated out of one of the office, out of his apartment at the Desert Inn called the Monte Proser Talent Agency. If you recognize the name Monte Proser, Monte Proser was the owner of the Copacabana in New York. He was the, at least the face of the Copacabana in New York. The ownership uh, there, as was the case with many other uh, venues and hotels back there, back then was uh, um, either Momo Giancana or Frank Costello. Frank Costello owned the Copa in New York. He also was very, very involved in the Copa here. He was very involved in the Sands here. Johnny Roselli's one-man talent agency, the Monte Proser Agency, owned outright by the outfit, the Chicago outfit. If you wish to work on the strip from 1959 to almost 1970, you were booked through the Johnny Roselli Agency, Monte Proser. They took 15% off the top, as does every booking agent around, and that 15% went directly back to the outfit in Chicago. These were not just the small-time lounge acts, the largest of the headliners, the big headliners, the Sinatras, the Jerry Lewises, Stephen Eady, and things like that. All of them had a book through Monte Proser or you didn't work the strip. It was another revenue stream that was available to the mob, and it was frankly a very good one. Now jumping over to the Rat Pack. As many of you know, because I know most of you came to Las Vegas years ago when it was the most fun thing in the world, and now you're coming back and hoping to find some of the same things, which of course don't exist. The Copa Room at the Sands Hotel had seating for 310 people. As such, when the Rat Pack played the Copa Room, it was virtually impossible to get in to see them. Jack and Trotter, also called Smiling Jack and Big Jack and so on, one of the most wonderful entertainment directors who ever worked out here, certainly one of the most talented men. He was the decision maker as to who comes in the room, who doesn't come in the room. Mostly because he was very bright, he allowed newspaper people in first, the owners in second, the mob in third, and then the high rollers 
came in after that. The Rat Pack was never advertised as the Rat Pack. There were four different entertainers who were each headliners in their own right at the Sands. There would be a name there such as Dean Martin tonight and Frank Sinatra would show up and Sammy would show up and Peter Lawford would show up and Joey Bishop would show up and that became the Rat Pack show. The cost of a Rat Pack show, including dinner, you know, they, at that time, of course, there were two different um, entertainment venues offered. The uh, dinner show, which was $10.50 at the beginning. It went up to $12.50 a plate at the end of in the 1964-65, which was kind of the end of that. That um, was what they were getting to see the Rat Pack. The fun thing at a Rat Pack show was you used to be able to see all of the mob guys who came to Vegas, all of the owners. At the, if the things you usually watch for when you were sophisticated in watching entertainment in the smaller rooms like the Copa Room and so on, is you wait till everybody is seated, you wait till the first of the headliners came out, <clears throat> and then you turn around and you look who's standing at the back of the room. The guys who came in and nodded to the maitre d' and could stand at the back and watch was real, the real juice in that room. The Rat Pack, of course, I'll just start off with Frank Sinatra. As everyone here knows, he was um, certainly the mainstay of Las Vegas entertainment. Uh, I think his first appearance here was back in 1951. He played at the Desert Inn. He played for Modalitz because um, Modalitz also was the big juice here in the early 50s. And basically anything that Modalitz wanted in the way of entertainment ended up playing at the DI. Perfect example of that was Eddie Fisher, when, who by the way, as was the case with many entertainers, he never got a paycheck while he worked out here. He signed his paychecks back to whichever hotel he was working at each Friday because that would go against the debt that he had he still owed the casino, which was in the tens of millions of dollars. And unfortunately, there were many, many entertainers out here that were in that same boat. Some names I'm just going to throw out. All of these are public information. None of this is uh, uh, things that I'm, I'm just springing or anything like that. Nat King Cole was a inveterate gambler, lost millions of dollars here. And again, he was signing over paychecks. Joey Lewis, of course, from some years earlier, was signing over all his paychecks, basically to Belden Cattlemen, who owned him outright. Um, Sheila McRae and her husband, Gordon McRae, were in that position, unfortunately, as were just a lot of other people. It doesn't matter. Everyone who works in Vegas knows you're not supposed to gamble. If you end up gambling out here, you end up signing over your paychecks or whatever the situation is. Anyway, Sinatra came here because he played a lot of the mob places back east originally, as did everyone, because most of the entertainment venues back then were mob controlled. The 500 Club in Atlantic City, the Chez Paris, the, just all, all the mob hotel, all the mob uh, um, casinos and, and, and so on there. They all played them when Las Vegas opened. Um, Jack and Trotter began coming up with this wonderful, wonderful idea that we're going to bring big stars in and that will attract gamblers. And of course, that worked perfectly. When the people who were involved in the Rat Pack, the fun years, let's 1960 to 62, let me talk about that two year period, which really was the height of the Rat Pack. The people who were involved in the Sands and who used to hang out at the Sands were Jack Kennedy and his brother, Bobby. Most cases, you will be able to read that he was actually only there for four or five stays. In reality, for many people who work at the Sands, as you're every single month he was up here at least for one weekend. Marilyn Monroe lived at the Sands. She had a permanent room in the aqueduct portion of the sand. She was there all the time. Mobsters who owned the sands, people like Doc Stature and so on, they were involved there. And Sinatra also lived at the sands. 
He had a standalone apartment. Sinatra was afraid of heights. Uh, in later years, he moved up to the very top of the Sands Tower, but uh, he was afraid of heights. They built him a standalone apartment. Between two of the back buildings at the Sands was a small building. You either knew it was there or you didn't know it was there. It was very camouflaged. That was Sinatra's uh, um, place at the Sands. Sammy, as everyone I'm sure is aware, was fell victim to um, the Jim Crow situation that was going here on here in Las Vegas through about 1960. Of course, Sammy Davis had started much earlier with his dad and his uncle, uh, uh, Big Sammy and Will Maston, as the Will Maston Trio. And uh, like other black entertainers, he was paid as much money as the president of the hotel was paid, but he could not stay in, those, in, in, the, in the digs at the hotel. Until Entrotter came along and changed that, until Sinatra came along and changed that, and a few other people. But Sammy, unfortunately, was a fabulous entertainer. I don't know if any of you were ever lucky enough to see Sammy Davis perform. My wife and I had seen him on a number of occasions, and of all the entertainers out here, far and away he was our favorite. Unfortunately, he was a sad man because he never could uh, um, quite assimilate into the rest of the Rat Pack. He was always not quite sure of himself. He was always the butt of everybody's jokes and so on, which he put his big smile on about. However, he was just not a very happy fellow. Sinatra, when he was um, playing at the Sands, was also an owner of the Sands. He started out at a 1% owner. At the peak of his ownership, he had nine points in the Sands. Same time he had nine points in the Sands, he also had 50 points in the Calneva Lodge in Crystal Bay, uh, 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 Lake Tahoe. And his partners up there, Hank Sanicola was one of his partners. Skinny D'Amato was another one of his partners. Both of these men were owned almost outright by Frank Costello. Frank Costello, as was the case at the Sands and a lot of other places, certainly the Copa, certainly the Fontainebleau in uh, Florida, which he also owned and had someone else fronting for him, Costello really was the, I hate to keep using the word juice, but that was the word that everyone understood back then, and he really was the juice here in the early 60s. When Dean Martin, who everyone knows had a totally different personality than Frank Sinatra had. Matter of fact, I've had a wonderful Dean Martin joke. I mean, it's not even a joke, it's a story. It's, it's, it epitomizes what Dean was. In the last 15 or 20 years of Dean Martin's life, he never paid for a restaurant check with cash. He would go into a restaurant, have his dinner, and then write them a check for $21.30, $19.34, bucks, whatever dinner happened to cost them. And like everyone in the world, you have a check from Dean Martin. Ain't no way you're going to cash that. You're going to put it inside a picture frame, put it up behind the cashiers. Hundreds and thousands of Dean Martin's checks float all over the United States, and he may have gotten away with hundreds of thousands of free meals. Bright guy, never told anybody about that. Just as Frank Sinatra was disliked by most of the service people, the people who were earning $1.05 an hour, the people he picked on. Dean Martin was really loved by everyone out there at the Sands. He was just such a nice, casual guy. He was the only one who would help furnish the dealer's break room. He put in the first color television set in there. It may have cost him $2,000, but that was a neat thing to do for dealers. The only thing that dealers used to dislike about Dean Martin, and it was just a really funny thing except if you were the dealer, when they were playing at the Sands, of course they lived there, and Dean would come downstairs into the Copa room, into the Copa room, into the uh, casino, and of course as soon as Dean Martin walks in the room, everybody stops, hey look, there's Dean Martin over there. And he would walk over to the first blackjack table that he could find, he'd reach across the table, grab a whole stack of chips out of the rack and say to the dealer, 
thanks, Pally, this is just tea money. Put it in his pocket, and everyone around them says, wow, look at that. Dean Martin is allowed to take money. Isn't that fabulous? What a great hotel this is, and so on and so forth. And he would walk away with whatever it was, a few hundred bucks. Certainly no loss to the hotel. Well worth it in free advertising that he got and all the <laughs> how amused everyone was. The person who hated that was the dealer. The end of his shift, he had to stay there and balance his table. He had to stay there and balance the rack. Two hours afterward, he, and then you never get paid for that, of course. That's, I mean, it's your responsibility to be able to account for all the money there. So a lot of the dealers at the Sands were a little PO'd at Dean for doing that, but he did that a lot. Sinatra, on the other hand, was friendly with nobody who was a worker at the Sands. He had many, many people fired there. He had many arguments. Just, just not a particularly pleasant man. The um, breaking from him at the Sands happened in 1967, the separation with uh, Sinatra and the Sands Hotel. 67 happened to be the year that that yo-yo Howard Hughes bought the Sands and moved Jack and Trotter, president of the Sands, down a notch and put in his own person and so on. And he wanted to get rid of Frank Sinatra. The reason that he wanted to get rid of Sinatra was Ava Gardner. Some years earlier, Howard Hughes and Ava Gardner had a long-term affair. Sinatra came along, took her, and Howard Hughes had absolutely no sense of humor about that. <laughs> and uh, he cut Sinatra off the right way. He knew to do it publicly, he's going to get this kind of reaction out of Sinatra. He spoke to Carl Cohn, who was the uh, casino manager of the Sands at the time, Carl Cohen let it come down, all the way down to the dealer, and the dealer was the one who had to say, I'm sorry, Mr. S., you've lost $5,000. I cannot extend you any more credit this evening. Sinatra was good generally for about $50,000 a night. He would sign markers for $50,000. The markers would hit the accounting room, and someone would go like this, throw them away, and that's the end of the money. It was entertainment money that the Sands was giving him. Occasionally, like everyone else, he would win, but he would just bet bigger until the house got all the money back. Anyway, he was cut off at $5,000, and uh, he did the expected thing. He went ballistic, screaming, yelling, cursing, all kinds of Sinatra um, things. Caught up, he thought it was Carl Cohen who had cut him off, and in actuality, of course, it was Howard Hughes through that wonderful speaker who was here last year and at uh, uh, just his last uh, uh, meeting a couple nights ago, Bob Mayhew, who was the one who acted on Hughes' behalf. He was told to cut Sinatra off, he did. Anyway, Sinatra goes outside, found one of those wonderful little carts that the Sands used to use, those golf carts that you could throw your luggage in that, and they would drive you back to a, a, an outbuilding wherever you happen to be staying. He grabbed one of those carts, drove through the plate glass window of the garden cafe, the garden room there, aiming for Carl Cohen, missed, of course, went over there, started using racial epithets and other th things that Sinatra was famous for. And then Sinatra, at 153 pounds, picked up one of his chairs and tried to throw it at Carl Cohen. And of course, he missed. And of course, Carl Cohen decked him, did break out all of his uh, uh, bridge work that was here. Sinatra's on the ground there. Other people had seen that. At the time, Sinatra's bodyguard, he actually always traveled with three, but his main bodyguard in 1961 was a very wonderful man named Jilly Rizzo, who was, looked very much like Luca Brasi, only he was, as I put it in the book, he wasn't as cute as Luca Brasi was, just one of, these, one of these guys, and I'm very happy to say I had the opportunity on two different occasions to meet him. Jilly's restaurants, you know, Chicago, New York, that's, that's all Jilly Rizzo stuff. Anyway, Jilly, picked Frank up off the ground, Frank was bleeding, and took him back to his room and helped him pack up, 
and took him to McCarran, where they took the private plane back to the Bel Air house that Sinatra had, was living in. Sinatra's wife at the time was Mia Farrow. He had been married about two to three weeks to her. She had just accepted a part in um, Andre Previn's movie. He was the executive producer of Rosemary's Baby. Frank was PO'd at her anyway, how dare a wife of mine work, and so on and so forth. And he had just been embarrassed and kicked out of the sands. He went home and uh, punched Mia Farrow in the face. Mia Farrow filed a police report that night with the Beverly Hills Police Department. They came over. Nothing else happened other than the fact that her photo was taken and the, and the uh, police report was written up. And that's, that was kind of a typical reaction that Sinatra had to a lot of things. When he was the 50% owner at the Calneva Lodge, I'm sure everyone here knows the Calneva is split between two states. The California side is for vacationing. The Nevada side is for gambling, cavorting, and so on and so forth. One of the people who were out at the Cal Neva on a permanent basis was Sam Giancana. Sam was also one of the owners of the Cal Neva, and he lived in cabin number 51, which was on the Nevada side. He lived with his then-girlfriend, who of course is still here in town, Phyllis McGuire, and the FBI and the Gaming Commission and so on. We're watching the him was aware of the fact that all the mobsters used to hang out up there, even the ones who were black booked, including Momo. So Frank was called in front of the Nevada Gaming Commission. Ed Olson was the guy who at the time headed the Gaming Commission. And Ed asked him, Frank, we understand someone from the Black Book, Sam Giancana, is living at your property on the Nevada side. You know this can't be done. You know the tenants of the Black Book, the agreements that we all have, and so on. Can you tell us what's happening? If at that point Sinatra was, oh my goodness, I didn't realize he was in the mob. I thought the cabin 51 was on the California side. I'm promised this is never going to happen again. Sinatra would have gotten a slap on the wrist and he would have continued at a, as a casino owner in the state of Nevada. But Sinatra acted in typical Sinatra fashion. He began calling Ed Olson and everybody else on the Nevada Gaming Commission he began using his colorful language. And Ed Olson was not, I mean, he was legitimately uh, a power here. He's the one who said yes or no to all the gaming license. Anyway, they lifted Sinatra's license. He had to sell his 50 points up, up north in the Cal Neva and his nine points down here. Interesting fact about who bought them, it was Jack Warner who bought the 50% of the uh, Cal Neva Lodge and the nine points that he had in the sands down here. The agreement with Jack Warner was, when I get my license back, you'll give me that back for the same money that, I, that you're buying. Uh, if you remember back to the story of uh, Benny Binion and Joe W. Brown, when the same situation happened and Joe Brown ended up getting Binion's uh, uh, casino and hotel and so on, he also promised that he was going to give it back. It never happened. I mean, it, it took 15 years of litigation and other things to get Benny Binion back in, and basically that's what happened with Sinatra also. The fellow who I mentioned at the beginning of this, Johnny Roselli, really was controller of illegal things that were going on here in Las Vegas. At the same time, he was watching for the mob's interest in the movie industry. And I make a point in the book, and everyone knows about the fact that Sinatra desperately wanted the role of Maggio or Maggio in um, that 1951 movie, which the name escapes me at the moment. From here, uh, what was the name of the movie? I'm from Here to Eternity. Okay, he wanted that, of course, and he was told no, he could not have it. Johnny Roselli was contacted, and he's the one who spoke to Harry Cohn, and he's the one who got Sinatra the role, and Sinatra, of course, won Best Supporting Actor for that, and after that, his uh, uh, 
singing career came back on track also. At any rate, the um, Johnny Roselli got into the movie industry, and I know I'm jumping around time-wise and chronology maybe. However, back in 1932, the movie industry needed money. The movie industry... All right, I won't talk about the movie industry. <laughs> what, what is that? Oh, oh, a fire alarm, okay. Uh, and if you, th if you think I'm going to bring up the, the uh, Kirk Akorian story with the original Bally's, I mean the original MGM hotel and the fire there, it's one of the things I'm going to stay away from. However, if that hotel had better alarms, and if they had um, um, a $61,000 sprinkler system is what that corporation decided not to put in. And also what they didn't put in was the asbestos in the ceiling. So when that fire started in the ceiling, it just went, I'm sorry, this has nothing to do with but the fire alarm. Um, yeah, if the sprinklers, uh, I'm, don't mind, I'm going to take off my hairpiece now. And <laughs> Um, okay. Um, <laughs> that's right. Everyone, please get out of the way while I make it to the back door. <laughs> um, Oh, to cut him off also as well as the alarm. Oh. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, it's a good story that I heard. I'm working on another book, by the way, called Showgirl Stories. And I had run an ad in the Review Journal saying Showgirls Wanted, minimum age 60. I ended up with, fortunately, this 51 showgirls who danced here in the 50s and 60s who have better stories than I do with going into this next book. But one of the stories just happens to, I happen to key on because of this fire alarm. This was told to me by one of my um, showgirls, who I'm not going to tell you her name, but she's quite famous and so on and so forth. She, Jack and Trotter, and Sinatra were sitting in the um, coffee shop of the Sands in 1960. Someone came over and whispered something in Sinatra's ear, and he said to these two people, you guys want to go see a fire? Sure, why not, let's go. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. Um, they got into Sinatra's car, they drove down Las Vegas Boulevard, and they parked their car in the uh, Sahara parking lot, and kind of watched across the street. 30 minutes after they got there, the El Rancho Vegas fire became apparent to everyone because fire was showing at that time. Now, if Sinatra had an hour's notice on the fire, and I heard this from somebody who I think know certainly more about Las Vegas than I do a thousand times. She lived through it and she sat here and she's gained a lot of, she's become quite famous also. I believe the story. It was a fire, as there have been other fires here in Las Vegas, that was a wonderful insurance fire, but I just, I had not heard that before, that people knew about it and they were showing up to watch the uh, entertainment that night, which was the El Rancho Vegas burning. All the other owners, by the way, out here were forced Belden Cattleman, the owner of the El Rancho Vegas, out of Vegas. They told him that he is no longer going to be an owner here. He's not anyone that they wanted to associate with any longer. The El Rancho Vegas burned. He made a zillion dollars off that, um, left uh, Las Vegas, went to L.A., became unbelievably wealthy in Los Angeles, and continued um, being a pain in the ass to everybody that he ever had any dealings with. And he was just generally a very, very unliked, disliked man, but um, he was forced out by the other owners here. 
The, um, going back to the Rat Pack for a moment, when Sinatra was kicked out of the Sands, he had already made a deal with Jay Sarno, who was the owner of Caesar's Palace. Caesar's Palace, when it opened, of course, opened with uh, money from the Teamsters, the Central States Teamsters Retirement Fund, which Jimmy Hoffa was head of. In actuality, it was a, a fellow named Red Dorfman, whose uh, son, Alan Dorfman, became quite famous in later years, lending money out here in Vegas, and Alan was uh, murdered in, in Chicago. At any rate, Sinatra's out of the hotel. He had already made a deal with Jay Sarno. The Caesar's Palace had absolutely everything, the most opulent everything. As you know, when it opened in 66, it had everything except a resident star. Every other hotel here was associated with somebody. Uh, Caesar's Palace had nobody. They just kept bringing in people. So it was a wonderful thing for Sinatra to uh, have that backup contract. What Sinatra insisted on and got was he would be paid $1 higher than the highest paid person on the strip. Back then, there were 15 shows a night, uh, 15 shows a week that every entertainer had to do, two a night, three on Saturday. Sinatra says, I do seven. I do one show a night, seven days a week. And Jay Sarno said, absolutely, you got it, buddy. Sinatra said, you're going to pay for my uh, bodyguards. He got three of them. You're going to give me $50,000 a night in gaming money, which he received. And you're going to help me get my gaming license back that he had lost six years earlier. Jay Sarno and his partner, Nate Jacobson, who were the real powers at the uh, at Caesar's Palace, and even though there were nine or ten different mobs involved, the two of them got together. They got together with the Gaming Commission, and Sinatra did get his gaming license back, which was a real big deal to him. Anyway, so he, he started there a year later. He, that worked for about a year, and then he got into a fight with a guy named Sandy Waterman, who was uh, a casino manager there. Sinatra began choking Waterman. Waterman pulled out a gun, this, that, and the other thing. Sinatra was again persona non grata up here in Las Vegas for a year. He reopened at Caesars in 68, which was a year later. And for that opening, his mother, Dolly Sinatra, was flying up here from uh, Palm Springs. And uh, she crashed, and sh she was killed on, uh, on the second opening that he had. In, in there. As a matter of fact, uh, well, it doesn't matter. That, that, that's what that situation was. The other people who Sinatra, who were playing with Sinatra, Sammy would do anything he was told to do by Frank Sinatra and did. He uh, left the sands. Dino, on the other hand, as everyone knows, was as independent a cuss as existed. And basically, he didn't, he didn't do anything to further his career. You know, he's just a very nice, easygoing guy. And Frank left the Sands. He stayed there an extra year. It wasn't until Eddie Torres, who was a good friend of Dean's, said to him, listen, I'm now president and majority owner of the RIV. Why don't you come over here? You'll be our resident star. We'll give you anything you want. And you, wanna, you want Dino's Den, a new bar named after you. You got it. And, that, and that's really what brought Dean Martin out of the, uh, out of the Sands. Um, I don't want to go deeply into Dean Martin because, you know, also, as is the case with many people, he had a very rough last few years when his uh, son was killed in the uh, airplane accident. He never recovered from it and uh, unfortunately died a very, very unhappy man. Um, Peter Lawford, I don't even want to go into. I'm sure everyone here knows the story better than I do about him marrying JFK's sister and the fact that he didn't do what he was supposed to do with Sinatra, and he got, uh, and Joe Kennedy was the one who said this, that, and the other thing. Anyway, Peter Lawford, who was not really a very pleasant man either, uh, was basically kicked out of the Rat Pack. Peter Lawford, by the way, I don't know if you know or not, comes from English royalty as well as big, big money. His uh, mother, whose last name was, um, yeah, something strange, his father was a lieutenant general in the, um, 
English Army, it was in the Dragoons, this, that, and the other thing. Anyway, in the last few years of Peter Lawford's life, he really turned into a lech. He was going, in his 70s, he was dating women who were not 20 yet. And uh, a lot of other things. Uh, some men were, uh, this question about this, that, and the other thing. And <laughs> when Mia Farrow and Sinatra got married, there was a comedian here who was just opening up the, um, I guess it was the Tropicana. Jackie Mason's guy's name. Is he the Tropicana or the Aladdin? Uh, it was the Aladdin. And Jackie Mason, who opened the Aladdin for Milton Prell, the guy who, who also owned the Sahara at the time, got out on stage and he said, hey, you guys hear about Frank Sinatra and his new bride? Sinatra, as you know, is 51 years old and his new bride, Mia Farrow, is 11. <laughs> and he kept doing that. And he was told, even after he was shot at, somebody shot through, this is when that was a one-story building, somebody actually shot through his window. He was told, hey, yo-yo, enough of this. He didn't stop. Uh, right out in front of the Aladdin, he was accosted going into his car. He was beaten up pretty badly, and when the, pol the true story, I mean, this was a, a, a direct quote, and when the police came out to ask him to file a report as to who just beat him up, he says, I really don't know, but somewhere in the background, I heard someone saying, doobie, doobie, doo. <laughs> and, they, and they quoted that in the Review Journal, and uh, he stopped. He stopped talking about Mia Farrow, the 11-year-old, because, Sinat and the woman was obviously, uh, what, 50 years younger than he was, for whatever that lasted. That marriage lasted a short while. Um, after that, you know, it's Barbara Mark Sinatra and so on and so forth. Anyway, that um, kind of ended the, that was kind of the beginning of the end for the Sands, as was the case with every one of the hotels that uh, Howard Hughes bought starting Thanksgiving Day of 1967 until the day he left here, which was Thanksgiving Day of 1971. He was involved in five hotels here in southern Nevada. He bought all five of them. That wonderful story about him moving to the top floor of the DI and not leaving. And, let, and he was told, if I'm not going to leave, I can buy this place and did and stayed. Wonderful PR story. It really was not true. The real case there was that earlier that year, uh, Howard Hughes had sold TWA and had $657 million in cash in his bank account and had to respend that or he was going to lose it to capital gains. Every single one of the hotels that Howard Hughes bought had two things in common. One, they had an open and outstanding loan to the Central States Teamsters. Two, Meyer Lansky was involved in every single one of the hotels. All five of the hotels, if you think about them and go on, all five of them shared those two things. Every single hotel that Howard Hughes was involved in lost money. He had promised Governor Grant Sawyer, if you let me come in, I'm going to do capital improvements, I'm going to put up schools, I'm going to put up a statue to you, I'm going to do that whole world. He did absolutely nothing, of course, as everyone knows. He did not sp the standard joke about the Hughes hotels, they were uh, within employees that we don't change a light bulb until the second guest tells us that it's burned out. And that uh, was his philosophy. That's, he did not spend any money here. Of course, what he did do was allow corporate ownership in, because prior to Howard Hughes, it was one person or two people or three people owning a casino because all of their backgrounds could be checked very carefully. Hughes came in, said, listen, I want Hughes Tool to buy this, eventually some Sumo Corporation and so on. Thousands of owners, there's no way that they could check a publicly held company who the owners were. Of course, that opened Las Vegas to the corporations. That stopped the Teamster mob money from coming in here and started junk bond money, the Michael Milken money. Nothing wrong with it, legal, but far more expensive than any Teamster loan that was ever made here. And anyway, uh, Howard Hughes was certainly not one of my favorite people. I, I really had, uh, everyone knows the story about uh, his great aunt, I presume, that the only good thing he ever did for the state is after the Mormon Mafia had him uh, very drugged, leaving uh, here going to the airport um, again on Thanksgiving Day, 
the story is on the way to the airport, he had, you know, he was the largest landowner in the state. He bought uh, uh, what was called the Hughesite property, 161,000 square acres. And on his way to the airport, he said, you know, I don't like the name Hughesite property. I'm going to rename it for my wonderful grandmother, Amelia Summerlin. And that's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the only good thing he ever did for the state was to uh, uh, get the town Summerlin going here. By the way, just another Howard Hughes interesting thing. I was going to write about this, but I just can't find the, the there was a woman here in the mid-1950s named Vera Krupp. Vera Krupp was married to the Krupp munitions money in Germany, and uh, she was a young actress and married to whatever Krupp's first name was, the, the, the skion of the Krupp organization. And she had already been through four divorces, and she had all of them here in Las Vegas. And she decided when she's going to leave her 71-year-old husband, she's going to come to Vegas and, because she knows how easy it is to get a divorce here and how much money she can make and so on and so forth. Anyway, she bought uh, a large piece of land, which at the time was called the Bar Nothing or the Bar None Ranch. I forgot which one. It was owned by Lum of Lum and Abner. By the way, the Lum and Abner show was actually done at the El Rancho Vegas and then taped and shown around there. Anyway, Lum sold her that, sold him, her that property. She renamed it uh, Green Valley. And um, she got involved in the Frontier Hotel and a guy named uh, Friedman who was screwing everybody who was involved in the Frontier, the new Frontier in 1955. She lost six and a half million dollars of her own money in that fiasco. And uh, she sold uh, what is now the Krupp Diamond. The Krupp Diamond, she got a lot of money for it. It was bought by um, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, whereas Richard Burton was the one who bought it. Anyway, I apologize for this jumping around, but rather than just go on and on and on here, let me open this for questions now, because I just keep going staccato fashion. Questions. Sir. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see Dean Martin on stage when he was just, you know, still had some presence. Didn't do a lot of songs, did a lot of talking. Held a glass. I have heard over the years that that was all a show, that he was not an alcoholic, that the glass was filled with iced tea, and he wasn't drunk on stage all the time. I've heard it also. I don't agree with it. Uh, most of the people who knew Dean Martin, and again, I go back to this new book that I'm doing. I'm not doing a sales pitch on it, but I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Uh, one of my showgirls, 77 or 78 right now, um, was friendly with Dean's second wife, Jeannie Martin. They were good friends, and Jeannie is the one who said, yes, he did have a drinking problem, and yes, he was drunk on stage. He didn't give a damn. It wasn't that he, was a, he had stage fright. He just liked drinking. And uh, I, have, I have no way of knowing, but uh, again, from secondhand from Jeannie Martin, that uh, he did drink a lot. In his later years, by the way, he didn't. You know, he, he kind of went away from that totally, but he was going straight downhill from there. Again, um, Dean Martin, when he was involved with Jerry Lewis, <clears throat> that association began, I think it was 1946 or 40, actually it was probably before the Second World. Uh, the breakup there was because of the fact Dean was so totally relaxed and he was involved with two very, very strong men in his life. Jerry Lewis was one of them who was a slave driver and everything was focused toward his success and the other one was Frank Sinatra who was also, everything was being focused toward success, and Dean Martin didn't get along with either of them very well because that wasn't the way he was. I mean, you know, you want to come and see me sing, come and see me sing. If you don't want to come and see me sing, go enjoy yourself somewhere else. And that attitude really made him the top draw here in Las Vegas. He pulled in far more premium players, whales, high rollers than Sinatra did. The mob guys loved him. I mean, it was just a, a, he was the epitome of what the Italian mob wanted to be. Sinatra, on the other hand, was the epitome of every other man who existed who said, oh, guy's got women chasing him, he gambles all night, he's up all night, he has guys like him, he just, and um, at any rate, I, I believe that uh, 
from Jeannie Martin you know, saying that that was the case, I would believe that he was a drinker. Question, sir. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's about the family, but I'll, there's a very famous picture of the five Rat Pack guys standing in front of the Sands sign. You know, their names are, and they're lined up in the same order. Just to the right of that, the photo was taken, I can't remember the photographer's name, but Columbia had put in a photographer to, to follow everyone around because they were doing Ocean's Eleven then and everyone was being paid and Columbia wanted as much publicity as possible. And by the way, Sinatra had a lot of his own money in that. Right off to the side of those famous five pictures, five men standing, was a woman named Judy Campbell. Judy Campbell Exner is what she married. And if, if Frank was standing here, they stopped the picture right here. Right on this side was Judy Campbell. Judy Campbell was um, a girlfriend of Frank Sinatra. She was a girlfriend of Sam Giancana. She was a girlfriend of many, many people who were on both sides of the law. And um, she was standing there while that picture was taken. The reason that Sinatra was there November 17th of 1960 was when that picture was taken, is he was invited to come to the Sands to collect some money. There was a satchel of money. The word on the street has always been, it's been it was a million dollars in a leather case that his press secretary, a man named Pierre Salinger, actually picked up. That was a million dollars in cash given by Jack and Trotter and the other owners of the Sands who really wanted Jack Kennedy as president, and they gave him a million dollars in cash that hit the Democratic National Fund, the major fund. Of course, at the same time, I mean, that, he got that. That's the reason that Kennedy had come to town, really, was to help pick up that money. Right down the street, the Aladdin at the time, uh, they were also contributing very heavily to the uh, Richard Nixon fund, so at least there was cash. It's one of the nice things about having a casino. There's so much money that does not appear on books that you can do things like giving a million dollars in cash to somebody. And back in 1960, they got away with stuff like that, just as they got away with being able to crumble up a uh, marker and not pay it. Now, of course, uh, everything has been, there's, there's no way that could ever work today. However, that, um, that was the Kennedy involvement. The only other Kennedy thing that I found as kind of amusing was um, Joe Kennedy, the old man, was really more involved in the Calneva Lodge than was even Sinatra. In the years previous to Sinatra coming in, that was the, God, I hate the term love nest, but that's where Joe Kennedy uh, had many of his women who lived there permanently. When, there was a guy named uh, Bones Renner, who was the owner then, and actually it was Joe Kennedy's money that had uh, built and added all the extra cabins and. In later years, he became a prude because his son was running for president of the United States, but he was probably the, one of the big, big time swingers. Of, and he, he and uh, Tony Cornero were good friends. The guy who you know, had the illegal gambling boat, started the Riviera, was the Meadows uh, Hotel here in 1931 and so on. But Kennedys were very involved with uh, Las Vegas and the women and the gambling and so on and so forth. And questions? Sir. A lot of times in the referencing of the Rat Pack, Joey Bishop gets left out. Four names, you know, as you stated earlier, and sometimes you get it on Bishop. What was his real connection to getting the evidence? Joey Bishop was the first of that whole group to play at the Sands. Joey Bishop started at the Sands in 1956 or 57, a good second rate stand up comedian, brought a lot of people in pleasant man, brighter probably than everyone else in the Rat Pack. And Joey Bishop actually wrote most of the impromptu things that they were doing on stage. He was the writer for the, he was the one who came up with the jokes, he was this, that, and the other thing. And he really did not fit in because he really wasn't a swinger. He, he and his wife have lived on North Roxbury and Beverly Hills since 1954. 
the word is he's never even looked at another woman, just a very straight-laced guy, and uh, apparently that was good right in the mix there because nobody else in that uh, group of men was anything but a party animal. And Joey Lewis really was, uh, Joey Lewis, uh, uh, Joey Bishop really was uh, uh, the anchor as far as what was going on on stage and so on and so forth. But of course, he's the only one of the group still alive. I believe he's 89 now, and he still lives in that same house on North Roxbury. Questions? There's a fellow here in town named John W. Smith, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the best research person in the world. I mean, I, I like my research, but I'm not, nowhere near his league. He has written, he now has 11 books out. The one that will address your question is a book called Running Scared. He wrote the book Running Scared about Steve Wynn. Steve Wynn of course, is the 800-pound gorilla right now in Las Vegas, and if you're smart, you don't poke sticks at an 800-pound gorilla unless you're protected by your newspaper. In his book, um, Running Scared, he names the mob that is probably still running Las Vegas, and that is the Gambino family from New York. He also says that um, Steve Wynn has been under the auspices of uh, that mob since 1966 when he came to town. I know there's wonderful stories out there about Wynn and his father who was the, on the bingo hall and later years got into something in South Florida and how straight he was and so on and so forth. The only thing I ever wrote about Steve Wynn, and this is just about as far as I'll ever go with him, is in 1966 when he owned 2% of the Frontier Hotel. He was on salary also to the Frontier as their um, slot manager and keno manager. He was 26 years old then. And Howard Hughes was spending money like he had to because he did have to spend money. And Steve Wynn's 2% of the Frontier became 4% seven or eight days before Howard Hughes bought it for an inflated price. He got the additional two points from a guy named Jerry Zarowitz. Some of you might recognize his name. He's in the Nevada Black Book. At the time, he was the money and power down at the Golden Nugget. He knew he was about to be put into the Black Book. So he sold his two points to Steve Wynn. He sold them. I mean, it wasn't a gift. It cost Steve Wynn a dollar apiece to get each of the two points. And... Um, <laughs> Steve Wynn, who made some phenomenal business coups here, that was one of them. Nowhere near as big as the one about Caesar's Palace where he bought that nice little strip of parking lot with the help of Parry Thomas and a few other money people here in town and he bluffed Caesar's Palace out. He's gonna, you know, ran that wonderful story in the newspaper, I'm gonna put it in the narrowest casino in the world, and Caesar's Palace says, well, that's just what we need is another casino sitting on our parking lot, because that piece of land was hidden. It was never purchased as part of the Caesar's Palace. Anyway, Steve Wynn made a lot of money on that also. Very bright man. I'm not going to ever say anything about his temper. I'm not going to ever say anything about the three attorneys, the mad dogs that he uh, hires just to look for things that are being said about him. When that book came out, Running Scared, the publishing house of that book was a company in New York called um, Four Windows, Eight Walls Publishing. No, no, Four Walls, Eight Windows Publishing. And uh, the Mad Dog Attorneys, the three guys that he hired, he, Steve Wynn went around and found the most vicious attorneys in the United States just to, as his personal attorneys to protect them from anyone casting aspersions on him. They sued the uh, publisher. Publisher lasted about two weeks. Went bankrupt the day Four Walls, Eight Windows went bankrupt. The Steve Wynn organization dropped their lawsuit against um, Smith because they knew if they go to court, Smith is saying in his book, his private plane was caught with cocaine on the plane. He was involved in a 
potential um, murder, one of the playgirls at uh, Caesar's Palace, one of the adornments that Caesar's Palace would offer many of his people, ended up dying on a boat on Lake Mead that he was on, as were a couple of other people, and it was hushed up, except that, you know, it was made public record, and um, a lot of other things. And uh, when the organization decided they did not want to go head to head against the Review Journal, they dropped the suit, but the publisher was forced out of business. This I published myself. Um, this is a self-published book. I do not have deep pockets, and I'm old enough to know that there are people around who protect themselves very well. I would never, ever in a million years say the mob's still involved in Vegas. However, <laughs> you know, when you think about it, with this amount of money that is coming into every one of these hotels in cash, and the people who are handing the money over having no record of what they've left there, You'd think, you know, there's some pretty bright guys who run these, the gaming establishments out here. You'd think with that kind of uh, temptation, the likelihood is someone has figured out some way to take a couple, three bucks off the top each night. And I wouldn't be surprised 15 years from now if there's someone else up here talking about when the mob ran Vegas in the early 2000s. <laughs> but, uh, you know, now it's computer and things like that. But um, the crime that was around back in the day was almost non-existent. I'm sure, I'm looking around the room, many of you are my age and older, I'm sure you remember years ago you used to be able to walk down Las Vegas Boulevard drunk, too much money hanging out of your pocket. Nobody's even gonna look at you, let alone accost you because the mob had a wonderful, wonderful marketing plan. The customers are supposed to do what they're supposed to do, which is lose money. We're supposed to do what we're supposed to do, is make sure they leave after they've lost their money with a big enough smile on their face that they're going to tell their friends back in Pocatello, Idaho, that first, I didn't lose anything. I, bo I about broke even while I was out there. <laughs> Second, it was the most wonderful vacation in the world. You can't believe the size of this room. They had a, a fruit basket for me, and I saw Sid Caesar. I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful stuff. It was a perfect marketing plan. Bring us your money, we'll take your money from you, we're gonna give you a good time, you're gonna leave here feeling like a prince. What an absolutely wonderful way to run a business. It was run by Tony Accardo, who, when he lived here at the, uh, he had lived at the Riviera and then at the Flamingo also, the best CEO in the world. I mean, this guy put 11 warring factions, 11 mobs, who each had vested interest in different hotels and had psychos here with guns watching out for their interest, he stopped mob war from ever happening here. He said, 11 mobs, 11 enforcers, 10 of you guys get out of town. We're gonna leave one enforcer here. Any of you can go to him regardless of your affiliation and he will take care of whatever your problem is. And that really stopped mob wars from happening here because it's one thing to come to Vegas and say, you know something, that guy over there looks like a mob guy. He's wearing a silk suit, he's got a nice four carat ring. I'm not sure, but boy, doesn't he look like a mob to you, a mob guy to you, Gladys? She says, yeah, I think so. And you see that woman over there who's been here, you know, at the bar now for four hours? I bet you she's not a school teacher, uh, you know, who's studying up for tomorrow's classes. But the point is that was the, that was the romance of Vegas. That was the fact that you knew you could kind of rub elbows with things that weren't quite what they should be, but you didn't see blood. Nobody picked your pocket. Nobody hit you over the head to take your wallet, and they certainly didn't cheat you at, at the gaming. Given that whole set of circumstances, this was a wonderful place to vacation. That's why Las Vegas is so large right now. People of our age, who were here 30 years ago and still remember, oh man, you can't get a vacation like that, decide they're gonna come here and live here. And of course, you can't go home again, you can't relive what was 30 years ago, but that's uh, my opinion, that's one of the reasons Las Vegas is so overpopulated right now. You had people who were 25 years old and they said to one another, you know, when we retire, we're gonna go out to, and they did, and it's just not there anymore. So that's uh, questions. Sir. Frank Lefty Rosenthal, wonderful guy, probably the best numbers man ever to hit Las Vegas. 
he probably did run sports numbers and sports book percentages in his head better than anyone else did. Putting that aside, he was a very tough guy to get along with. He never smiled at anybody. Um, just not a very nice man. Frank is still alive. He lives in South Florida. And if any of you are interested in reading his website, he puts out a new story every month. His website is frankleftyrosenthal.com. And he is also one of the people that is in the Nevada Black Book. So he can only come up here twice a year in his costume, and he does. And as is the case with many other black book people, he just, you get along with whatever hotel, and uh, they put you in a suite, and instead of you going downstairs to gamble, they'll bring the blackjack table up to your room. There are, Frank Rosenthal does come to Las Vegas, and I am very proud to say um, he and a number of other people corrected some facts I had in the book because I asked everybody. As far as I'm concerned, when you're talking about history, it's not fair of you to make stuff up. It's, it's, it's perfectly OK if you're a novelist. But when you're passing history down, that's why I tell every single person it would be a favor to me if you re you know, I, I try to be thorough. But if you read something I'm wrong about, I mean, my skin is not only this thick, I think it's important to make a change. And I've heard a few things and I've fine-tuned it. But um, <laughs> Frank Rosenthal was, took over for Alan Glick, that very nice young man who was loaned $162 million without any uh, collateral, and the one who bought the four major hotels that became the Argent Corporation and ended up um, receiving the largest single fine that the Nevada Gaming Commission had ever issued for skimming out of the stardust. Second largest fine for what this is worth, and this is an area I never talk about, but I don't care. I'm up here, this is the end of my speech, and I'm going to talk about somebody I even dislike more than Cattleman. And that is the fellow who opened the Imperial Palace Hotel. I've never written about him. I don't like even saying his name, but if you know who I'm talking about, it's also the guy who owned half of the, helped build half the Las Vegas Speed. Way. He got the second largest fine ever levied by the Gaming Commission. Ralph Engelstad is his name. He was fined one and a half million dollars because the Gaming Commission found out that that funny story about him requiring his top executives to attend Adolf Hitler birthday parties at the very top of the Imperial Palace while he was wearing a stormtrooper's outfit, the swastika here, and a phony mustache. And they investigated it, and sure as hell they found it. Yeah, that's true. If the Nevada Gaming Commission came up with enough information to fine him a million and a half dollars, which he paid, I believe the story. I think that that was the case, and he, anyway, that's, sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't go into that one very often. However, that guy just really uh, rubbed a lot. You know, there were two, there's two Jewish guys here in town, the two wealth, two second and third wealthiest men here in town, Sheldon Adelson, Steve Wynn. Like is the case with both billionaires, they don't get along with each other. I mean, ego against ego and so on and so forth. Both of those guys took picket signs and walked out in front of the Imperial Palace. It's the only time they got along. They agreed that this guy's a, jur uh, a Nazi. And they picketed the Imperial Palace, these two men. Do you know um, Sheldon Adelson? Yeah, just this little thing about him. Do you know his wife is a surgeon, an eye surgeon? And she has two offices, one here in Las Vegas, one in Jerusalem. And apparently, she makes almost what he makes. I've heard three to four million dollars a year is what she's uh, making. I know he's worth 12 billion, but uh, just think about it. I don't like Sheldon Adelson particularly, like many owners who take down things from your childhood. He brought the sands down. We knew a lot of people there. A lot of guys who are my age now never got jobs again because everyone who left the Sands, had a rebid for their job at the Venetian. And you get a guy 63 years old who's, you know, earning a lot of money, been there for a lot of years, and a 25-year-old also coming in wanting to be a dealer. The 25-year-old, almost 100% of the time, got the job. And, you know, it's, it's one of them, business is business, but 
nonetheless, just as you dislike certain people, I dislike certain people, and Sheldon Adelson is unfortunately one of them. Questions, sir? Um, as far as I'm concerned, Oscar Goodman is a good mayor. I think his jocular way of saying things like, you know, put me on a desert island with a bottle of gin, and uh, I would cut off the hands of the mar uh, taggers and the rest of that stuff. This is Vegas. I mean, you know, nobody, for Las Vegans, I know he is a resident problem. For people who live in Omaha, He's the epitome of Las Vegas. He's a plain spoken guy. He used to be a mob attorney. He, he knows everybody. He keeps secrets. But by the same token, Oscar Goodman won his second election. He got 88% of the popular vote. He also likes my book, which is another reason. That <laughs> and, and as he put it, and he, I don't know if he ever said this, he, I, I heard him say we were having coffee. He said, So what? My clients paid me cash. <laughs> You know, he was an attorney who did what an attorney is supposed to do and protect his client. And of course, <clears throat> Oscar Goodman was 6'4". His most famous client, Spilatro, was 5'5". Five, five. And nobody ever laughed at them when they walked together. Just a, a Spilatro thing. Spilatro obviously was a diminutive man. He was a short little guy. Spilatro's arm, Spilatro's money, not his money, his strong man was a guy named Fat Herbie Blitzstein. And Fat Herbie, who by the way was shotgunned here in, in Las Vegas in 1988, Fat Herbie Blitzstein was 6'7 and had more hits than Spilatro had. And when you see Spilatro and the Mutt and Jeff uh, uh, Fat Herbie, um, made quite a scene, but again, nobody ever laughed at that. But uh, Spilatro really was, he was the last of the real monsters who came in from Chicago. The guy I was talking about earlier, Johnny Roselli, Spilatro had the same job, but 20 years later. And uh, he was genuinely, you know, Sp uh, I'm sure common knowledge, Spilatro didn't really start at the Stardust. He started at Circus Circus. He owned the uh, gift shop at Circus Circus. It was called uh, Tony Stewart, Anthony Stewart Limited was the name of the gift shop. He owned it. He, uh, Jay Sarna was told by uh, probably, uh, well, one of the teams is maybe Hoff, I would assume so, that we want to send this nice young man out there. This was 68, the year that Circus Circus opened, and we'd like him to cut his teeth out there. Do you mind selling him the gift shop at one tenth of what it's worth? And he said, sure. And uh, Spilatro got to buy the gift shop for, I think it was 75000 and he had to borrow 60000 of that money, and that went through. The, I, I cover that in the book. It's kind of interesting how he came up with the $60,000 through the Teamsters and so on and so forth. Um, after he was kicked out of Circus Circus, by the way, when the two Bills came in, Bill Bennett and Bill Pennington, the guys who went on Mandalay Bay and so on and so forth, um, they got Spilatro out of there, and he went over to the Dunes. It was Sid Wyman was the president of the Dunes, a very loved man, treated his service people well, and Sid Wyman died. And um, a guy named Morris Schenker came in, and Morris Schenker was an SOB. He was a mob guy. He was teamster guy and totally dislikable, apparently. I never met him, but I had heard that from a lot of people. He's the one who let Spilatro come into the Dunes and Spilatro set up his office in the Dunes poker room, one of the very back tables there, and that's where he did business. So between Tony Spilatro, who everyone was afraid of, and Morris Schenker, who everyone disliked, who was also at the poker room all the time, that wonderful poker room that Sid Wyman used to be able to play high stakes poker in, and they used to bring in all, Kashagi, Adnan Kashagi got started then. I mean, it was a wonderful poker room. They, anyway, that, uh, I, I never liked Morris Schenker or anything. Morris Schenker, by the way, was probably the model for uh, Tom Hagen in The Godfather. He was, um, had one client. He was an attorney. His only client was uh, Jimmy Hoffa. 
just as Tom Hagen's only client was Don Corleone and a lot of other things, but there was a lot of correlation between those two men and people I know who are in the movie business said, yeah, they, that was the model. Questions? Thank you all very much. Thank you.